Hi everyone, how are you? My name is uh, Bhaskar Sankara. I'm the editor and publisher of Jacobin Magazine, and I'm the occasional ho host of these Jacobin Talks, which we've been having on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays around 6 p.m. Eastern. And we've also been broadcasting weekends with Anna Kasparian, Nando Vila, uh, every Saturday at 1 p.m. And with this Jacobin YouTube channel, uh, we've been doing this completely on a shoestring with the help of our producer, Kale Brooks. And our only ask, so we keep doing this programming, is that you press like and subscribe. And if you're so interested, please do log in and leave your comments for our speakers. Uh, so um, we have a, a great lineup for the rest of the week on Wednesday. We have Tom Frank, who'll be speaking to us about his new work, which is a history of populism and anti-populism. Uh, then on Friday, we're going to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of Jacobin with a show. We're going to have some Jacobin favorites say a few things um, about, um, you know, what's what's been going on. Uh, with our publication in the last 10 years, all the interventions we made, what we have in store for the next decade. We don't ask you for money normally on these broadcasts. I think during that broadcast, we will in fact ask you for dollars for 10 years, which sounds like a decent bargain. But of course, all that content is going to be available for free. So today, I'm pleased to be joined by Hadass Chair. And Hadass is an activist and a longtime socialist in New York. Uh, she's Jacobin Circulation Manager, and she's the author of A People's Guide to Capitalism, An Introduction to Marxist Economics, which just came out from Haymarket Books. And I actually read Hadassah's book early. I blurbed it. I, um, at first, was a little bit nervous about blurbing it because I really didn't feel like reading a book of economics. And uh, I tend to like actually read from cover to cover of books when I blurb them, not out of some sense of, of honor and duty and obligation, but because I like just don't want to end up with my name on a piece of like genocide <laughs> apologetics or whatever else, you know. Um, our good friend and, and comrade, like Norm Chomsky, like definitely signs too many petitions. He's too nice and people take advantage of that sometimes. Um, so, but in fact, it's it's a really um, accessible guide that I wish I had access to when uh, I was an undergraduate, and and really just deepening uh, my knowledge of of Marxist uh, theory, because Sadas actually has a very strong um, understanding of uh, neoclassical and classical um, economics. Um, her knowledge came from being an autodidact, from being self-taught, and from being an activist, and came out of a sense of political engagement. So she really has a, a great way at getting to the core of what's compelling about, about um, the Marxist um, economic framework. And really what Marxism is, of course, is a critique of political economy. It's not on a 100% freestanding uh, system. So it's, it's important to have that grasp of what mainstream, if you want to put it that way, economics is. And Hadass today is going to be telling us about uh, neoclassical and classical um, economics. She's going to be explaining what it um, allies, uh, namely class and class struggle. And we're going to have a discussion afterwards. We could ask her lots of questions. but. Please do uh, go to the haymarketbooks.org website if you're interested in this talk. And we have a link in the description and get a copy of her book. If you buy directly from Haymarket, you'll better support um, Haymarket authors. You'll better support uh, Haymarket, a really important uh, publishing house on the left. So obviously, Jackman just turned 10. Haymarket, I don't know, is how old? Maybe 20 years old, or, or it's been around for a little bit longer. but. Alongside Jacobin and Versa Books, um, it's a 
um, AK Press and PM, you know, it's one of those important institutions on the left and we all need your support and we all do a lot with very limited uh, resources. But uh, with that, what I'll do is turn it over to Hadas, who will speak for around 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, then after that, we'll take your questions. So once again, please press like, press subscribe, and leave your comments in the feed for Hadas. But uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave, leave it to you. Great. Thank you so much, Pascar. Um, yeah, so the premise of this talk is that mainstream economics hides class relationships and uh, deliberately confuses much more about the economy and how it works than it explains. And on the face of it, I think that seems pretty self-evident, right? If you consider the mainstream uh, economic obsession with the stock market, the ups and downs of the stock market do have some important implications. And especially now that so many of our retirement plans, to the extent that people have retirement plans, are bound up in the stock market. Um, it's not, it doesn't represent nothing. It provides also some indication of the confidence of investors in the economy. But by and large, I think it's obvious to most people that a stock market that climbs to new highs in the midst of the greatest economic crisis we faced, um, you know, since the Great Depression is of limited explanatory value. Um, so for instance, the Washington Square Journal about a week ago on one of their podcasts, they, dis they discussed how SoftBank, which is a Japanese technology investment company, is likely to have been a major driver of the dramatic increase in the value of technology stocks, which themselves then played a really big role in the stock market taking off earlier this summer. Now, I really don't know enough about SoftBank. In fact, that podcast was the first that I heard of them. Um, so, you know, I can't ascer ascertain the validity of that claim. Um, that they were like the main driver of uh, the stock market, you know, reaching new highs. Um, but I think, you know, while the stock market is certainly a platform for tremendous speculation and the actions of big investment companies do have a huge impact, I think it's safe to say that the health and strength of our economy isn't determined by single actors like SoftBank. Um, their actions and consequences of their actions certainly tell us something about how you know, wildly and irrationally, the stock market can swing, and it may be reflective of some broader trajectories in the economy. Uh, and perhaps, you know, SoftBank and other firms like SoftBank play an outsized role in the economy. But, you know, questions like what and how much and in what way are things being produced in our society? Who can and cannot afford those goods and services? What's the state of employment and unemployment? Um, what kind of you know profits and profit rates are being generated? You know these are the kind of things that we have to tackle if we're going to understand the relative health and strength of the economy, not to mention its impact on our lives. But by and large, what passes for analysis in um, you know in in mainstream economics is commentary about the stock market, reporting on commodity prices and interest rates, and um, you know. If you look at this current crisis, you know we could probably forgive mainstream economics, or at least cut them some slack, for not being able to properly explain the current crisis that we're in. Um, you know, leaving aside for the moment that there are there have been some very good radical and Marxist analyses of the current crisis that I think have been very clarifying. Um, you know, despite that, you can you could certainly say, well, you know, the current crisis is unprecedented. We don't know exactly how it will all play out. Um, it couldn't have been predicted, um, but but let's um, you know. But if you look, for instance, at the last major recession that took place in this country from 2007 to 2009, the Great Recession, despite the breadth and depth of that financial meltdown and the recession that followed, most mainstream economics actually had very little to say. Uh, in the midst of the crisis, for instance, the former chairman of the Fed. Uh, Alan Greenspan said that he was in shock disbelief and that the crisis was precipitated by an inexplicable once in a century credit tsunami. Uh, my favorite reaction was from the economist Eugene Fama, who is considered the father of uh, the efficient market hypothesis, which is basically uh, the idea that markets are fully democratic and always lead to correct economic outcomes. Um, so when, when he was asked about what caused the recession, he responded, we don't know what causes recessions. 
I'm not a macroeconomist, so I don't feel bad about that. We've never known. Debates go on to this day about what caused the Great Depression. Economics is not very good at explaining swings in economic activity. Um, so, you know, besides poking fun at economists, which, you know, you could, you could do, but the main point is really that if you can't apply a set of ideas to real life, then those ideas are not much use. Uh, now the main strands of mainstream economics, not, not all of them, um, but, but the main strands of mainstream economics, um, which we'll talk about in, in a moment are, are based on the idea that markets are efficient and rational. Um, and therefore, economists really struggle to explain these periodic and devastating crises that we're subject to. If, to borrow a metaphor from, from Leon Trotsky, it's like having a raincoat that only works when it's not raining. Um, so when the economy is chugging along, and you can make the case that you know, the invisible hand of the market, as Adam Smith uh, called it, knows best, uh, then when it breaks down, you have to chalk it up to a once in a lifetime uh, tsunami or some other seemingly unpredictable external force. Um, so, so on the one hand, um, you know, I think the uselessness of mainstream economics is, is pretty self-evident. It doesn't correspond to our real lived experiences. It's confusing as hell. It doesn't really add up. But on the other hand, I think we have to say that some of the main propositions of uh, mainstream economics, that the system of capitalism is somehow natural to human beings, that even if some of the worst inequalities are inexcusable, um, that you know people like Jeff Bezos deserve at least some of the wealth that they've earned. You know, maybe it needs to be taxed more fairly, et cetera. But um, but you know, after all, didn't he come up with the ideas or work hard or whatever? Um, a lot of these ideas have won out and have become entrenched in the way that we see things. And that's not necessarily because of the cunning or persuasive power of economists, but through the uh, hegemony of capitalism as an economic system, what Karl Marx called the silent compulsion of economic relations. Um, essentially, you know, once capitalism was fully developed around the world, this silent compulsion of economic relations sets uh, the, you know, the, the, the seal on the domination of uh, the capitalist over the worker. Um, it seems like now just the reality of everyday life, you don't really question it, we wake up, um, if we're lucky, we have a job that we can go to, we get paid for our work, even if it's not enough, um, it still seems like a re reasonable trade um, of you know, my labor for your money. Uh, and we can use that money to buy the things that we need, um, hopefully a roof over our head, nourishment, pay the bills, et cetera. Um, and if we're really lucky, you know, have enough left over to buy music or art supplies or your subscription to Jacobin or whatever you're into. Um, it all seems pretty normal on most days. Um, and it really only gets exposed as abnormal when it breaks down, right? Um, whether for some groups of people, it's breaking down all the time, right? Um, even in good times because of racism and oppression um, or, or for nearly everybody, it breaks down during periods of exceptional crises uh, like we're seeing right now. So because of this, I think to get beneath the kind of common sense, seemingly natural state of economic affairs, we need an analytical tool that not only has a better explanatory power than mainstream economics, we need a tool that can actually go beneath the surface appearance of everyday life to reveal the underlying economic laws of the system. Um, and, and to that, and fair warning, I'm gonna argue um, throughout that I think the necessity of Marxist economics is, a, is, is that useful tool, uh, just so you don't think I'm pulling a bait and switch on springing Marxism on you at the end when uh, I was supposed to only talk about mainstream economics. Um, but that's, you know, I think the, the, the heart of um, why, why Marxism um, is an important tool with, with, within that context. So mainstream economics obviously covers a lot of ground. That's a broad term that I'm using um, and with many different schools and strands across the entire history of capitalism. Um, so my intention here isn't to like, you know, give an exhaustive overview, uh, but just to discuss the main tenets of classical economy and you know, people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Um, what changed with what's known as the neoclassical economists, who are also known as the marginalists, uh, whose ideas are dominant today. Uh, and then, you know, what the classical and neoclassical economists share in common and why, uh, even when some of their ideas might have particular, particular interest or in interest, um, on the whole, they can't explain the way our society actually works. 
So, so classical political economy set out to explain and understand how capitalism works, uh, beginning in the late 18th century with Adam Smith, um, who's the kind of mo most well-known um, you know, founding thinker of classical economics. Uh, he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Um, various other well-known figures like David Ricardo, who probably did the most to systematize classic, um, classical economic thought uh, to people like Thomas Malthus, who famously wrote the essay on principle of population and Jean-Baptiste Say, um, whose law of market became really foundational uh, to mainstream economics, uh, to a whole host of figures um, who for almost a century grappled in different ways, debated with each other um, about a capitalist system that at that time was still young. And for all the limitations of their theories, there was a sense, you know, this was a period of enlightenment, um, that they were trying to make sense of the world, um, not doing it apart from ideology. They very much had an ideology. They were committed to the idea that capitalism was a natural and a good system that uh, was best fitted for human society. Um, but they also based their philosophies on an understanding of class, um, to some extent on labor as a source of wealth and on questions of, you know, falling profitability. Um, you know, incidentally, some of the um, ideas that are most associated with Marx, like the labor theory of value or um, falling profitability were actually concepts um, that uh, the classical economy, economists, especially Ricardo, had first raised. Um, so capitalists, I think, in their early stages really needed theories that could explain social classes and contradictions where, you know, they wanted to know where wealth came from, how it could be um, uh, deepened, uh, how it is distributed. Um, of course, you know, ultimately, they sought to understand those questions um, and the various classes that they identified um, in order to try to smooth over any contradictions and make a case for capitalism as a system that worked for everyone. And capitalism, they argued, was a natural system, the inevitable consequence of economic progress of humankind. Um, and the main, the main tenets are basically private property and trade, and that both property and trade are natural and intrinsic to the human condition. Uh, and capitalism is, uh, capitalism is therefore the system that's most conducive to humanity. And that you know, idea is still very much widely accepted today for sure. Um, it's put forward by think tanks like the Cato Institute who explain things like, you know, put out various policy papers that explain that property rights are prefigured in nature by the way that animals mark out territories for their exclusive use of foraging and hunting and mating, um, that the human mind is built to trade. Um, so, you know, th those are the ideas that, that still dominate. Um, and while Smith and Ricardo base their economic theories on the existence of classes, they assume that classes kind of gradually arose through a process of increasing division of labor developing in society as a product of, as ec economies developed, um, you know, these classes developed along with them in order to have a better division of labor. Um, so what they called the factors of production were land, labor, and capital. And those were wielded by classes of landowners, workers, and capitalists. Uh, but each of these classes make their own specialized contributions to production, and each of them benefit accordingly. Uh, so the classes aren't, uh, are just an outcome of this technical differentiation within the production process, which happened naturally over time as economic progress took place. Um, Marx mocked this idea that a primitive accumulation of wealth led to this natural division of labor in society where some people happen to have capital and some people have land and the rest of us, you know, just happen to have only the skin on our backs. Uh, and the way that he wrote about it in, in Capital was primitive accumulation plays approximately the same role in political economy as the original sin does in theology. Adam bit the apple and thereupon sin fell on the human race. Its origin is supposed to be explained when it is told as an anecdote about the past. Long, long ago, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, above all frugal elite. The other, lazy rascal, spending their substance, uh, subsistence and more in riotous living. 
as it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth and the latter sort finally had nothing to sell except their own skins. And from this original sin dates the poverty of the great majority who despite all their labor have up to now nothing to sell but themselves and the wealth of the few that increases constantly although they have long ceased to work. Such insipid childishness is every day preached to us in the defense of property. Uh, so now Marx had a very different explanation, which is that classes as we know them under capitalism arose through a very you know, particular historical process and his particular historical conditions. Rather than just a gradual idyllic evolution, uh, capitalism in Marx's words came dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. It was an extremely violent and cataclysmic process that took place over the course of several centuries where in the corner of the world where capitalism happened to uh, initially take hold in England, the masses of people were forcefully expropriated from their land, then disciplined into becoming a working class through like, un unbelievably brutal laws, which called for beating, branding, mutilation of uh, vagabonds and beggars, basically anyone who um, did not take their place and, and go to work in the, in the mills and in the factories. Uh, and this is an important history that's missing from classical economy. And it's important not only for the moral point about capitalism really not being a system uh, based on, on, on human uh, thriving, um, but also because without this social and historical context, capitalism becomes naturalized by not investigating where private property comes from or how categories like wages, profits, and rents came to be, they become natural truth. And, and they misidentify social relationships. Uh, instead of social relationships, we see a simple technical processes. So for instance, you know, the power of machinery over workers in the workplace, the kind of daily grind that um, we're subjugated to by uh, machinery at our workplaces, or in some cases where machinery replaces workers and then um, you know, creates further unemployment, um, what, what Marx called the, the power of power of machinery over workers um, by the classical economists is considered just a technical process rather than a social process based on who it is that makes the decisions and who benefits from those decisions uh, at the workplace. So, you know, the other point that I think is important to classical economy is that for, for economists, class uh, was not a bad thing because actually everyone benefited from the accumulation of wealth and capital, perhaps to different degrees, sure, but everyone would benefit according to their contribution. Uh, they saw the profound wealth that the economy was now able to produce as a very, just a very positive result of capitalist production and free trade. Uh, the basis of that free trade in, in the theoretical writings of the economies are abstract, rationally acting individuals, um, separate from any social or historical context, unconstrained, by imposed obligations, capable of making just rational judgment based on their self-interest. Um, and this is an idea that continued on with the marginalists, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in just a second. Um, but the exchange relations that individuals enter into uh, is considered by classical economy to be essential, essentially symmetrical. You know, you have two parties, let's say one of them is a worker and one of them is a boss, um, can exchange commodities uh, that the other one wants. So I have my labor, you want my labor, you have cash that I need to buy other commodities. So we make a fair exchange. Um, and since, you know, each such exchange is freely agreed to by both parties, it must be because it's an advantage to both of us. And therefore it serves the common interest. Uh, and Marx here again, made fun of this idea of free laborers. He said, sure, workers are free, but they're free in a double sense. They're free to sell their labor, but they're also free of any property, free of the ability to produce their own subsistence. And since we don't have our own land, much less you know, factories and tools to produce the clothes and telephones and ovens and all the various things that we need to get by, um, because we don't have access to what Marx called the means of production, we're free to sell our labor, um, but only in the sense that we can either choose to sell it or we can choose to starve. Um, and that, is a social context that matters quite a lot. And it flies in the face of this idea of just a free exchange uh, because we don't have a choice but to sell our ability to labor to someone else. We enter into agreements 
that actually aren't to our benefit um, because, you know, depending on, on the state of the labor market, depending on the state of the balance of class forces, they, we may be in a better or worse position. Uh, but ultimately, we can't just walk away from it because um, we have to, to somebody or another, uh, sell our labor power. Um, and, and that, um, so, so we, we get paid for a day's work, um, with ostensibly a day's wage, right? But we produce a lot more for our bosses than we're paid for. And that's the essence of exploitation. And, and we agree to an exploitative, uh, agreement because, uh, we have to work. So for example, you know, one, one example that I use, uh, a lot just for the sake of simplicity is let's say you, you work at Starbucks and they pay you. $120 for an eight hour shift, but you can make $120 worth of overpriced, you know, coffee in an hour or less. Uh, even once you subtract the cost of materials, um, Starbucks doesn't pay you anywhere near the value you've created, um, which is at least hundreds of dollars a day. And in fact, um, a Starbucks barista recently told me that he makes about $1,500 for the store in a five hour shift uh, and gets paid $11.45 an hour. Um, so that's, you know, the essence of the agreement, um, that you're entering into the capitalists. Um, you, they buy your labor power, your ability to labor, not the actual fruits of your labor, which is actually a greater, uh, value usually on the whole. Um, so you make the value back for them that they've paid you within an hour. And then the rest of the shift, you don't just like throw your apron and go home. Um, you're basically working for free. Um, and here Marx wrote in Capital um, that the wage form thus extinguishes every trace of the division of the working day, paid the working day, paid labor and unpaid labor. All labor appears as paid labor, right? They've paid you for your eight hour shift, um, even if you've made back that money for them in the first hour. All the notions of justice held by both the worker and the capitalist, all the mystifications of the capitalist mode of production, all capitalism's illusions about freedom, all the apologetic tricks of vulgar economics have as their basis the form of appearance discussed above, which makes the actual relations invisible and indeed presents to the eye the precise opposite of that relation. So, um, so just to move quickly um, and say a few things about the neoclassical economists. Basically, you know, they in some ways just continued the work of the classical economists um, and attempting to naturalize the capitalist economy as just inherent and um, timeless. Um, so they, they picked up on that job about a century later in the 1870s uh, by economists like, economists like Stanley Javons, Carl Menger, and Leon Walrus. Uh, the classical economists basically got stuck on this point of um, how do you define value under capitalism? Uh, David Ricardo, I think I had mentioned, he went furthest among the classical economists to say that value was actually determined by the amount of labor time that went into producing it. And that's actually very similar to uh, Mark, what Marx says. Um, Marx developed that idea further. Um, but, and, and a number of the classical economists agreed with that idea to one degree or another, um, although Ricardo kind of had the most systematic view of it. Um, but, but even Ricardo's ideas about the labor theory of value were incomplete, and they didn't really add up to um, a system where you could draw a clear line between a labor theory of value and the prices of products. Um, so, and, and apart from that problem, which the, the neoclassical economists tried to address, there was also the problem, you know, an un uncomfortable reality, um, which is that there were very radical implications, of course, to the idea that labor produces wealth. Um, you know, especially as capitalism became more established and working class movements began to grow more, uh, this wasn't an idea that mainstream economists really wanted to actively promote, right? So the neoclassical economists came up with a theory called marginal utility. And at its core, it argues basically that a commodity's value is based on its utility. Uh, whereas the classical economists had, had rejected that idea because they noted that, you know, well, it doesn't, really makes sense that something is valued by how useful it is because diamonds are way more expensive than air. Uh, the marginalists went, 
you know, got around that problem by saying, well, the definition of utility is, um, is through the lens of scarcity. That's what actually produces value. Um, within um, uh, uh, the context of scarcity, when, the, when there's not enough of all the commodities to go around, then the laws of supply and demand um, really set the prices. So of course, air for the most part doesn't cost us anything because it's plentiful. Um, but once we're dealing with finite resources, then they can be valued on the basis of how much utility they bring us. Um, so a, a simple example of this is, let's say a thirsty person wants to buy a bottle of water. The more bottles of water she buys, the more thirst quenching utility she gains. Uh, but at a certain point, as she hydrates, each additional bottle of water brings in diminishing returns. Um, and this is basically, you know, a, a demand curve. While she she may have been willing to pay two fifty or three dollars for a first bottle of water that she's desperate for, by the third bottle, she's not likely to pay more than a dollar. By the sixth bottle, she's not going to pay anything for it. Um, she's reached maximum utility. And if we're char going to chart out the amount of money she's willing to spend, that's where you get this. Uh, demand curve that we're seeing. So on the other hand, the company that's producing bottled water measures its marginal cost to see how much it would cost to increase production by each additional bottle of water. So the marginal cost is then the cost of producing one more unit of a commodity at a time. And it would include any additional cost, more labor, power, more equipment, or factory space for the next additional unit. And if you plot the cost of production for each additional unit, um, you get a supply curve. And then where the supply curve and the demand curve meet, we find this pretty equilibrium uh, for prices uh, right in the middle there um, and, and quantities of goods produced. So, um, so value here is, is established on the one hand by individuals that are maximizing the amount of utility they get from purchasing a good and on the other hand, a corporation maximizing the amount of profit they can achieve through producing and selling those goods. And where those two values meet, you get the cost of a product. And there are some um, more complicated assumptions, obviously, than just the water bottle example I used, um, where you, instead of having a two actor market, you have an infinite actor market um, in the world of perfect competition. But that's a sort of basic outline of um, a rational market. And um, just as the classical economists abstracted their theories uh, from social and historical context in order to provide a model in which classes just existed and the different actors within those classes enter into a free exchange with each other, the marginalists too remove social and historical context and show a free and rational system in the abstract. And in this case, now they've, they, we no longer trouble ourselves with classes either. Uh, they, they, they drop that concept in favor of everyone is a rational economic individual appropriating the optimal allocation of resources based on uh, their own self-interest. Um, so then the market, whether it's a, you're talking about a supermarket for goods or Amazon or the labor market for trading, uh, sell, buying and selling labor power um, or markets for financial instruments or what have you, all of these markets provide the means by which individual preferences can be realized uh, without imposing any extra external constraints on individual choice. Uh, so one of the founding thinkers of marginalism, Carl Menger, argued in um, his principle of economics, he says, thus human economy and property have a joint economic origin since both have as the ultimate reason for their existence, the fact that goods exist whose available quantities are smaller than the requirements of men. That's the scarcity we're talking about. Property, therefore, like human economy, is not an arbitrary invention, but rather the only practically possible solution of the problems, that is the nature of things, imposed on us by the disparity between requirements for and available quantities of all economic good, all economic goods, meaning we have this problem of scarcity of commodities, uh, the market and private property are the only uh, reasonable solutions um, for that. And um, just as classes were for the classical economists, the result of just a technical division of labor um, that just appeared because we needed, you know, economically a technical division of labor rather than a social process. Here again, the market is just a technical instrument through which human beings can achieve economic 
self-realization rather than being social institutions that are made up of different social actors with very different positions and interests. Um, and so for instance, I mean, there are, there are a lot of issues with marginal utility, but among them, the labor market is a glaring problem. Um, you know, labor power is a special commodity under capitalism that's wielded by human beings. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, workers are given the choice to work or to starve. Um, and that is a pretty big difference from a company selling water bottles, which can decide to simply walk away from a transaction and not sell if the prices drop too low. So a theory of, of social classes explains a difference in this position uh, rather than just assuming that that's how it is and we all um, enter the, the process equally. Um, marginal util utility instead gives us uh, you know, a theory of pure individuals all seen as equals in the market. So, so just to conclude with where I started, um, which, is where, which is that a theory is only as useful as it can be applied to real life. Um, the power of Marxism is that it's a set of tools that can explain our, real, our, our lived reality. It's a theory which understands capitalism as one of social relations of exploitation. Uh, and that is a theory that I think makes a lot of sense um, when you're exploited at work, for instance. Um, whereas, you know, a theory of rational economic actors that all enter into a level playing field, producing and exchanging for the common good, explains very little about your workday, much less about the broader uh, dynamics in society, about why this very rational market, um, you know, you still can't find paper towels or N95 masks six or seven months into a pandemic. Um, but mainstream economics is this ideology that promotes the status quo by naturalizing things that are actually uh, very much historically and socially conditioned. And by doing so, it doesn't, you know, they don't go past the surface appearance of life under capitalism. You go into work, you get your wage, you go home, you know, um, you buy the things that you need. And it, and it leaves the real economic laws that exist beneath the surface hidden. Um, it, it doesn't have an interest in exposing uh, those those real economic laws, and um, yeah. So I'll just I'll just end there. I think Marxism, uh, which I hope this talk will encourage more people to explore, is is a much better analytical tool uh, in order to do that. Well, that was that was excellent. And just a reminder, everyone in the chat, please leave Hadas your questions, um, and I'll try to get to a few in the next twenty minutes or so, um, or however much time we have. Um, I guess Hadas, one question that I have is that obviously, and by the way, I'm beyond a non-expert, so much so that on this topic, you should converse with me like you were conversing with this. I have experience time. in that. But um, on, the, right, on, on the issue of, um, of how we relate to, let's say, neoclassical um, economics, it's very clear that the field of neoclassical economics is used to, um, to remove uh, class, to remove the category of kind of the, the worker, right? There's just different parties engaging in exchange with each other um, to the extent that a worker might be mentioned. It's a mm -hmm. worker as a consumer rather than a worker at the point of uh, production. And getting into this kind of nature of like proletarian unfreedom, the fact that you might be engaging in a free contract, unlike in slavery and other more regressive systems, but work or starve isn't really a fair choice. It's a contract mm -hmm. made under under duress. That, that all is, is obviously um, true, but I'm wondering um, to what extent we need to uh, agree with, let's say, Marx's labor theory of value, or um, let's say even Marx's thoughts on the tendency of the rate of profit to, to fall, or, or all these other kind of um, uh, touchstones. Like, would it be possible to, as let's say Romer does or someone like that, essentially take neoclassical, the neoclassical model and try to use it in framework that we're using it in a politically committed framework to undermine, in fact, um, class class society. And what do you think about that venture? And mind you, I'm not particularly versed 
in this, I just do, I do know mm -hmm. that the Romer and that whole school were called, um, I think, pejoratively, I'm guessing, no classical Marxists. So I figured I, I mentioned that. And I do know there's, there's a lot of smart Marxist economists um, or people who were close to the tradition, or even if they didn't call themselves Marxists, like Joan Robinson, who certainly shared our mm -hmm. political commitments to socialism, but were critical mm -hmm. of, let's say, labor theory of value or um, Marxist position. Yeah, on their I, think, I think that's a good question. I mean, there there are a lot of debates among whether among Marxists themselves or among, like you said, people that are consider themselves close to Marxists and uh, other radical economists. Um, but yeah, but even within like the Marxist tradition, there's a lot of debates about the um, the labor theory of value. Certainly, a lot of debates about the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Um, both of those those concepts, like I mentioned in, in my talk, were actually not things that um, Marx came up with. And Marx didn't spend a lot of time talking about the labor theory of value because it was sort of um, a common idea at the time that didn't have to be explained that. that it, it, it was classical economics and he was writing a critique of the political economy prevalent in his day. Right, right, exactly. So, um, I think that, I, I guess I would say a couple of things. Um, I personally think the labor theory of value is very useful. I, I don't think it's a prerequisite to agree with it in order to understand um, certainly some of the, the most important uh, pieces of how the economy works, right? About um, exploitation, about inequality. Um, I think that the, the reason that it's useful, I, and, and I would say, I think it's a very misunderstood concept in the sense that um, it's, right, the idea behind the labor theory value in, in a nutshell is I'm sitting on a chair, how much is that chair worth in relation to a car? Well, it takes a lot longer to make a car than it does to make a chair. Um, if it takes, you know, a hundred times longer to make a car than a chair, then a car will cost approximately 100 times more than a chair. I'm oversimplifying. Um, and the idea, but Marx was very clear that the value imbued in a commodity based on the amount of labor time that's gone into it isn't a then determinant of price because there's, and this is where Ricardo got tripped up because uh, he didn't make, he didn't distinguish between those things uh, and then it didn't really add up. You know, you can't just translate, it takes five hours to make a chair and it makes 500 hours to make cars and there's not a direct relationship there between prices. Um, there's a number of complicating factors about um, that, that then between value and price um, that, that we could talk about. But, um, but the, the thing that's important about it is that like what, it, what are the main drivers of production of wealth in our society? Um, what is it that adds new value uh, to, you know, to, within a production process? Uh, it's labor that actually contributes uh, added value. Um, and that this, the labor theory of value that is determined in general by labor time is a really important, plays a really important function in terms of competition among capitalists. So for instance, um, if you're a chair maker and you're using whatever technology you've been using for the last 10 years and it takes you five hours to make the chair um, and somebody comes along and they have new technology and they can make a chair in four hours, um, now the market will adjust accordingly. And that's why computers and cell phones and all these things cost a lot less now than they did when they originally came on the market because now the technology to produce them means that they're produced a lot faster and that's, um, that gets translated into, into the market and into prices and puts, you know, overall kind of drives um, prices down, which is a good thing for each individual capitalist because um, they, they need to drive down their own prices in order to compete with, their, with other companies. Um, so, so I think it's important not as a like, how do you find a price tag? But it's important in terms of um, what are the, the underlying dynamics that are driving capitalists to have to produce more efficiently, more cheaply um, in economies of scale, et cetera. And um, 
Yeah. So, so I will say there's this, there's debate about that point among Marxists. And I think it's a perfectly valid debate. Um, I think that there are, there are other ways that you could look at it, but I think that the, the main issue with um, neoclassical economics is that um, it's, it can't just be a slight tweaking of it um, because the whole edifice of it is, um, is an abstract, uh, 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 deliberately abstract theory of rational individuals as opposed to a, so, a living social um, you know, set of relationships in our society where it, it's not about us each acting rationally or not rationally, um, but it's about what are the um, what are the economic conditions that we're 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 tied to. Um, I could say more about the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, but I think um, you know, as a as an overall point, that's what I would say about the. Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfectly rational that people go to work every day all around the world for a dollar a day and, <laughs> and work their ass off to, to take care of their, their family. The, the wider question is what in politics, what in the economy put them in this situation to begin with amid all this abundance and wealth that in part their labor you know, created. And these are the questions that I think as, as Marxists we ask, and th these are the questions that, that Marx in his work asks, and it's 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 tied in with these moral, a moral and ethical uh, dimension too. Mm -hmm. Even saying that there's exploitation is bad, like the existence of exploitation in our framework might be empirical, mm -hmm. but the fact that exploitation is bad, you know, that's that's a moral and ethical thing we have in our in our politics. So there's a question from Omar and a few other people in the chat, Omar on Facebook and a few other people uh, that I think. Um, well, the question is, has there been a rebuttal to the calculation kind of theory, criticism, price setting under Marxist and planned econom uh, economies? And I think these questions generally just rely on a conflation of Marxist economics, as you're discussing it, with the economic system of state socialism, which mm -hmm. often drew on Marx as justification for centrally planned uh, systems. I think we can essentially leave it as there, uh, but I, if you want, you know, you could go go further there. You know, I think we, there, there's nothing incompatible with with uh, believing in kind of a Marxist political economy and also believing these were inefficient, bad systems at beyond the political level and economic level too. Totally, I, I, I think that does sum it up. And the only thing I would add is again, that the essence of Marxism isn't like who can't isn't can't just be left to a, a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for technical division of who is it that um, owns the companies and then who is it that then distributes the profits. It's a social relationship, so it's fine to say, well, the state owns these factories and these plants. Um, but then who controls the state? So if, if, if it's not the vast majority of people that are democratically controlling the state, then it doesn't really help us to have a small number of bureaucrats that are in charge versus a small number of other corporate bureaucrats that are in charge. Um, so yeah, I would just, that's, that's all I would add. Yeah, there, I mean, I think there's, there's wider issues of, of calculation that we could get into in another discussion maybe on 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 how we we overcome that or soft budget constraints or whatnot but regardless i think what we could agree with is that in a undemocratic authoritarian society it becomes much harder to have inputs and adjustments and we mm -hmm. saw that most starkly with famines and other things where news of it couldn't even spread in civil society and you know all these other things are just compounded by the authoritarianism of those those um those systems so Sergio asked a question that's, uh, I, um, let me see, it's a little bit jargled, but I'll, I guess it defines it as the employer takes on some sort of risk, right? So isn't there value in the risk they're taking on? And I guess one way of summing it up is capitalists aren't just parasites, right? They're in fact con contributing to the labor process or contributing entrepreneurial risk. Um, how does that fit into the Marxist standpoint? And, and Sergio, if I'm bastardizing your question, please let me know. 
Cool. Um, yeah, well, one one thing just on, on a very basic level is like, let's say they make some contribution. What is the level of that contribution? Is it, you know, 2,000 times the amount of contribution than the person that comes into work uh, every day and has to toil to to produce the goods? Um, I don't remember the, I don't remember off the top of my head the, um, the disparity right now between CEO pay and average worker pay, but it's massive. So even if you could say capitalists contribute something, do they contribute like times like 2000 or 5000 or however much it is? Um, you know, and, and, and I think that that has been made very clear in the current, you know, current pandemic and the current context of, you know, Jeff Bezos's wealth has been just through the roof exploding. Um, and meanwhile, the people that work at Amazon are the people that are putting uh, their lives and health at risk uh, and are being denied unionization or being fired um, for, for, for unionizing, et cetera. So, so that's just one like, you know, general thing to say. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, well, capitalists contribute something but what they contribute is what they've already stolen from you. Um, you know, where does, and that's where the question of like where wealth comes from is really important um, because it's not only the fact that when, to, when a worker and a boss meet themselves in the like free market or the free labor market or what, what, what have you, that um, they don't come in from totally equal positions and they don't come out with totally equal um, products, that's, I think, self-evident. But not only that, but every time that a worker goes into work and enters into this agreement, then everything that you produce at work is then um, the, the profits off of what you've produced are used by your boss to um, make a greater profit through things like technical innovation, through um, Basically, you know, in order to compete, like I said, with other with other companies, the c capitalists are always taking the profit that they've made from your labor, reinvesting it into further productive. Um, and, and across generations too, like capital goods are dead labor. You know, it's right. it's, it's from it's it's from the contributions of, of workers in the past. But you know, Marx in, in the Gotha program says says that nature is just as much a source of, of, of value and, and wealth as, as um, the contributions of, of, of workers. And I guess you could even say that capitalists, or I'll use a much more hyperbolic extreme example, but if you follow me, like a slave owner um, is coordinating contracts, is sh uh, coordinating the shipping and distribution of plundered goods um, accumulated by by slaves, you know, it, it, all, all these kind of um, things. And I guess the argument is their role is, it's not like they're doing absolutely nothing, but their role is absolutely unnecessary and their existence contributes to more exploitation or suffering. So in today's workplaces, we can easily imagine a team of workers uh, getting together and electing even representative management, even if you feel like you need a division of labor and having that be open and transparent and having these democratic um, inputs. So again, right. maybe I even misinterpreted the questions to begin with, but if that's a question, these are your responses. <laughs> okay. I, I did synthesize that accurately. Um, let's see. Um, I think you're, you got at a lot of these, these questions. I mean, there's a little bit more like, what do you think about Cohen and the analytic Marxist, but I feel like you've touched on this and I don't want to get any in, into any particular um, thinker in, in, in depth is kind of beyond the scope of the last four minutes of this conversation. But for people asking for starting points beyond, okay, first of all, for the person asking what book should you read to learn <laughs> more about this, this is a book talk for A People's Guide to Capitalism, an introduction to Marxist economics. So for that question, this is your introduction to Marxist economics, and you should check that out on um, the Haymarket website. For some reason, 
my upstairs neighbor is like playing tennis or something. Like, I don't know what's going on, but if you hear that pounding, that's what that is. Um, but but do you want to recommend anything else? I, do, you have a further reading section in your in your book, right? Yeah, so, I do. So um, what 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 are some other titles that that you know the in, intrepid autodidactic um, young or maybe not young socialist should should uh, should get into? Um, well, I'm creating more work for myself by by saying this, but uh, Vivek Chibber has a great set of pamphlets called the ABCs of of capitalism that that uh, we have at the Jacobin store. Um, I, I recommend those. I think they're, they're a really good introduction. I mean, I, I honestly think, um, you know, it's the reason that I wrote my book is in part to provide an introduction and in part to make it easier for people to actually delve into reading Marx themselves. Um, and I, for me, the thing that was far and away the, the best political education that I had was reading Marx's Capital. And, um, I think you know if it's if it's overwhelming, or even if it's not, it's good to start with my book. Um, it's a good primer for it. Um, but I think reading Marx's Capital um, is you get a sense not just of the bits and pieces of the theory, but about an overall method um, and what is is the kind of analytical method that Marx used that's so that's so useful. Um, and it's also just a beautifully written book. It is. Um, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And the main thing that I would recommend um, if you do read it is to, is to read it in small groups. Um, I, I found it way harder to read when I first picked it up on my own than when I, you know, got together with a small group of, of people that just met, you know, had brunch every Sunday and talked about a couple chapters at a time of the book. Um, but that's my, that's my best recommendation. And there's also, there's David Harvey too. So if oh, you're yeah. alone during the pandemic, you have the David Harvey videos, which are all online. And I guess his, his companion too. Uh, Mike Beggs, one of the Jacobin um, editorial board members also wrote this autodidactics guide to understanding economics um, mm -hmm. that is kind of more pitched in the intermediate level. He, he's a professional economist, so he might think that this is introductory, but I've tried to read some of these books and you know they're hit or miss, like the King one was good. Anyway, there's some there's some good uh, titles in the Jackman archive, but please do uh, check out uh, Hadassah's book. I just double check the prices and it is cheaper on the haymarketbooks.org website than it is on Amazon either. So you have a, a slightly less terrible route to get the get the book um but thanks and as a again. rational economic actor you'll prefer to get the 30 percent off discount than the one at amazon exactly exactly and also you know amazon you have no idea what they're doing with their your data haymarket books the worst thing they'll do is like send you a newsletter about like with coupons and stuff like i don't <laughs> even know if they do that but um in any case uh, thank you all uh, for tuning in. Thank you to Hadas, and please do tune in on Wednesday when we'll have Tom Frank talking about populism and anti-populism, and on Friday for our 10th anniversary show, and on Saturday at 1 p.m. for another edition of Weekends with Anna and Nando. And thanks again to Kale, and I hope to see you all on Wednesday. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, thanks to us. Thank mm -hmm. you.